Thank you. A lot of work went into that. We're very thankful. All right. <clears throat> well, if you're reading through the by, through your through through scripture with the church reading plan, you're in Daniel. So you're doing a nice review of Daniel. And uh, at the end of chapter six, Darius he said, "For he is the living God and enduring forever. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed, and his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues, and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth." Well, let's pray together to this God, Father. We come before you as the God who created all things, as the God who delivers, delivers from sin, delivers from evil thinking, evil attitudes, evil behavior, sinful behavior, rescues us from Satan, rescues us from death, rescues us from eternal damnation. Lord, thank you that Jesus came and died on that cross for us. Lord, as we look into your word now this morning, thinking about Christ, make him real to us, I pray. May he be maybe more real to us as a result of having heard these wonderful hymns, bringing him to us, and make, make him uh, more real to us than maybe we've ever sensed him before. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, thank you. Turn, your, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1. This is a Christmas message, but this is a Bible message. <clears throat> and we are going to look at verse 14 this morning. And I would like you to, um, if you have your, I think that's going to come up there, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe not. There it is. Good. Read it. Let's read this together as we look at God's Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. That is such a wonderful verse. John MacArthur wrote about the first five words there. These five simple words are probably the most profound statement ever made in the history of the universe. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. On July 20th, 1969, at 10.56 p.m., Neil Armstrong set the first human footprints, footprint on the moon. And he famously said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. That was an amazing accomplishment for humans to make, to go from earth to the moon and plant their footsteps, footprints up there. But infinitely more amazing is the Christmas story that God came from heaven to earth as a man and put his footprints all over Galilee and Palestine, Middle East, over there. You could have seen his footprints in the sand along the Sea of Galilee, if they have sand there, whatever they have. You'd have seen his footprints. John 1.14 captures the essence of the amazing and true story of Christmas. Every word in this verse is spiritual gold. And we're going to look at it in five parts this morning, each as weighty as the others. So let's get started. First of all, and the Word, Christ's undiminished deity. John uses this word, Word, to describe Christ because Word means revelation or explanation. When someone wants to tell you what they're thinking, they speak. Calvin translated this word, word, which most of you know is logos, by the word speech, and the speech became flesh. God revealed to this world his son and called him 
his word, his message. If you go back in John chapter 1, I'm going back to verses 1 through 4. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. He, in him was life, and the life was the light of man, of men. And we're celebrating the birth of Christ as God's revealed word, his son. He was there in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God. That was the word, Genesis chapter 1. There he was in all eternity, coexisting with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. He was with God, it says in chapter in verse 1 there, the word was with God, and he was God. And the word was God, undiminished deity. The word that God sent to us. And he created everything. There isn't anything that, that, that is that Christ didn't create. He created the universe. And if there is a universe beyond our universe, he created that too. He is the creator. He created man, Adam and Eve, in Genesis chapter 1, male and female. He created and designed you as a human being. He created your eyes and ears your joints, your kidneys, your lungs, your heart. He designed and created everything in your body. So when he came into the world as the revealer of God, he came in a body, which we're going to see, that he had designed himself. Those verses in Hebrews chapter 1 are so good. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions, in many ways, Old Testament, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He is undiminished deity. Second phrase is he became flesh undeniable humanity. He became flesh. This is called the incarnation, or we could make up our own word and call it the infleshation. The eternal creator, Logos, the word, became flesh. And commentators, many of them, point out that he did not say, John did not say, and he became man. He did become man, but John uses the word flesh of the incarnation. This reminds us that while he was undiminished deity, he became lowly flesh, just like us, skin and bones, skull, brains, physical. He slept, he became hungry, he thirsted, he ate, he drank, he became weary, he wept, he rejoiced, he was moved to anger, righteous anger, he had compassion, he really suffered, he really shed his blood, he really winced in agony as he thought about the coming cross. They beat him physically, they really buried him in his body, in, in, the, in the grave there, a body of flesh. He became flesh, skin and bones. You know, he's still skin today. He took our skin. I have to tell you about a man that I'm fascinated by. His name is Ziska, Z-I-Z-S-K-A, Ziska. He was a Hussite back in the 13 and 1400s. He, was, he only had one eye. And uh, he was a great commander for the Hussites, fighting against the Catholics and so on. Never lost a battle, 
invented all kinds of new ways of fighting, used gunpowder in new ways. But Ziska, they say, now whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it fits my illustration, okay? They say that before he died, he told them, when I die, I want you to skin me and use my skin for drums so that when you go into war, I'll be going into war with you even after I'm dead. Really, check it out. Jesus became flesh, skin, bones, and so on. He's still skin and bones today. He's glorified, but he's still a man today. He became flesh. It says he, um, but how did he become flesh? That's the great problem. How did the word, this eternal logos, become flesh? And, of course, here is the greatest mystery and the greatest miracle of all history, how the logos became flesh. You know, an angel, Gabriel, came to a young girl there in Nazareth named Mary and told her that God had chosen her to bring the Messiah the son of David, the king, into the world. But she, and that she was going to have a baby. And she said, impossible. I have not known a man. And Gabriel said, aha, let me tell you something. The power of the Most High is going to come upon you. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And God is going to do a great miracle in you. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. She, he said, you will miraculously conceive, and this baby will be the Holy One. Mary humbly submitted to, the father, for, to God's will. So he, she said, let it be done. And it was. The Logos undiminished deity in a hidden, miraculous conception, virgin conception, became undeniable Humanity, Born nine months later in Bethlehem, Mary's child was both God Almighty, creator of all things, and now humbled into humanity. He was totally God, and he was totally man in one person. This is a mystery and a miracle we should never get over. The incarnation, the infleshation, of the second person of the Godhead, creator of all things, become flesh. An amazing thing. Mystery and miracle. It took the early church leaders at least four major councils to finally figure out how we can describe this, this person who is both God and man. Finally, in 451 A.D., at the Council of Chalcedon, which is over in Asia Minor, they finally came up with this. Christ is both God and man in one person. Two natures, one person. We call that the hypostatic union. That will be on the test. The hypostatic union. God and man Somehow joined together two natures still, but one person. That's also called the theanthropic person, the God-man person. The word became flesh, dwelt among us. We'll get to that in just a moment. But just imagine now, just imagine. You should take some time to think of this. You know, we're driving around these nights looking at all the lights, how pretty it is, how wonderful it is, how beautiful it is. Just imagine if this never happened. People like Marx, people like Rousseau, Darwin, and many atheists of our own day who would rather God not have come or don't even believe there is a God, just imagine how dark and filled with death and doom everything would be imagine if this never happened if Christ never became flesh we would have a godless darkness which <laughs> we have some today but and we would have only death 
and gloom, no eternal life. Wesley wrote for us this great hymn, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased in flesh with us to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. We wouldn't have a hymn like that if it never happened. He became flesh, undeniable humanity. Third, he dwelt among us. And I'm just calling this his impeccable life. He dwelt among us. Impeccable means without sin. He was pure man, flesh, skin and bones, but he was without sin. Impeccable. His impeccable life. He dwelt among us. I like to think of us here as not just that generation 2,000 years ago and the disciples and so on, but he dwelt among us. He dwelt among human beings that populate this planet. We are human beings. And he dwelt among human beings. He created Adam and Eve and then joined us joined the human race through Mary and lived for 33 years among us. You could have seen him. You could have seen him. He wasn't just a phantom or a myth, a spirit. He didn't just seem to be there. You could have shaken his hand. Imagine that. If you were close enough to him like John was in the upper room, You could have felt his body heat, 98.6. He dwelt among us. If we went back in time 2,000 years, we could get on a ship on the East Coast and go across the Atlantic through the Mediterranean to the West Coast of Palestine, walked up to Galilee and actually saw him. He dwelt among us. He never sinned. No one could accuse him of sin. His life was impeccable. There's more there, though, and he dwelt among us. Now, that word dwelt is the Greek word skenao, and it comes from the noun skene, which means tabernacle. So he tabernacled among us. You remember the tabernacle in the Old Testament? It's where... Israel met with God, or rather, God met with Israel through all the sacrifices. God met with his people through that tabernacle. Exodus 25 said, And let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell with them. Think about that. That I may dwell with them, John 1, 14, and dwelt among us. Whenever the... Shekinah glory moved, the tabernacle moved, the people moved with God. When it stopped, they stopped. Well, think about this. When Christ, the tabernacle from God, God with us, got up and walked away, the disciples got up, walked away with him. And when Christ sat down, they sat down. The tabernacle. He dwelt among us. There's a lot more there I'm not going into this morning. But uh, I do want you to know this, though. He tabernacled. He dwelt among us. Like, and I think he was in fulfillment of the, that tabernacle in the Old Testament. Is there's fulfillment with Christ dwelling among us because God with us. Emmanuel. God with us. But listen to this in Revelation 21, 3. Same words, skene and skenao, noun and verb. Revelation 21, 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among us. He dwelt among us, human beings. For 33 years. He's coming back again. Just hang on to that. We'll get to it. Fourthly, 
John says, we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. His glory, his his inimitable glory. What does that word mean? That's a good one to write down. Inimitable. It means not able to be imitated. Nothing like it. Unmatched. Unique glory. He became humble flesh, and he lived his impeccable life but he manifested his glory. We saw his glory. What is that glory? The glory of the brilliance of deity, of his divine nature, coming through in various ways. He did what no other human being could possibly do. He turned water to wine. John says that showed his glory in chapter 2. He walked on water. He cast demons into pigs. He raised dead corpses to life. He gave sight to blind people, hearing to deaf people. These are all glimpses of his glory. We saw, the disciples saw it. He commanded the wind and the waves to stop, and immediately they stopped. He created bread and fish out of nothing for thousands of people. And then one time he took Peter, James, and John up onto a mountain, and there he was transfigured before him. There the glory of God, the glory of Christ's divinity came forth from him. His face, remember he's flesh now. He became flesh. We beheld his glory. His face shone like the sun. So apparently they couldn't even look at him. His face shone like the sun. His clothing shimmered with brilliance. Pure glory here. The deity of Christ coming through, even though he was fully man. Fully man and fully God. By the way, he even somehow had the capacity to bring Elijah and Moses there. People who had died years ago. The glory of of God. They saw his glory. And then, last, and this is so rich, he was full of grace and truth. His incomparable character, his, he was full of grace and truth. This is just rich. When you stop and think about it, he was full of grace and truth. Great men in this world are often arrogant, hard-hearted, self-promoting, even murderous. Men drunk with their power over others. What was Jesus like to be with him? Was he nasty and cruel? Was he demanding and egotistical? I enjoy biographies, and many times the author, the biographer, will devote the last chapter to do a presentation of the man's character. What kind of character was Jesus? Incomparable. Unlike all other great men and world rulers, If you could spend some time with him like the disciples did and come away, what would you think? How would you describe Jesus? Full of grace and truth. He's full of it. Everything about him, full. Marinated, saturated, thoroughly permeated with grace and truth. The fountain of grace and truth. God revealed his character to Moses in the wilderness there in Exodus uh, 34, 6. It says, uh, as he's described, God is described there abounding in loving kindness and truth. So Jesus abounded in grace and truth. He was a man full of grace, just like this song we just were blessed by. His arms were open wide. He, He was full of grace, which is exactly what We human beings who are cursed by the fall, we are sinners to our core. We needed grace. And Christ, the Lagos, 
who became flesh, they saw his glory full of grace. Think about that. Not lacking any amount of grace. He didn't come to the world to condemn the world, John 3, 17, but that the world through him might be saved. We are guilty, vile sinners to the very core, desperately in need of a Savior. There he came, full of grace and truth, full of grace, grace, giving us what we don't deserve. God's riches at Christ's expense, grace. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sins. So he came with his arms wide open, welcoming poor, lost, guilty sinners. Watch him there in John as he goes and talks with Nicodemus. Actually, Nicodemus came to him, and he explained to him the way, of, the way to eternal life, to be born again. Watch him there at the well when the lady comes from, from the city in Samaria there, Samaritan woman, how he talked with her full of grace. That man born blind... And how he gave him eyes to see. The woman caught in adultery. How he dealt with her full of grace. He didn't overlook sin. He didn't excuse sin. But he said, go and sin no more. Right? Full of grace. Grace pardons and also grace empowers. Full of grace and truth. To that one man that was let down before him at that house where you know, there, his, the, his friends brought him in and he was let, let down in front of Jesus, Jesus said to him what? Your sins are forgiven. Wait a minute. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Aha, that's the whole point. He had the power to forgive sins and he was full of grace. That doesn't mean he overlooked sin. We need to remember that the next time Christ comes, He'll come full of strict justice. Justice on those who refuse to bow their knee to him as Lord and Savior. Full of grace. Now, and full of truth. And this is so refreshing. Full of truth. We, friends, are living in a flood of lies. We can hardly believe anything we hear through the culture through the media we are overflowing with lies we are in a war against truth of all kinds Christ came full of truth truth is what really is that's what truth is truth is what really is and Christ was full of of truth. He never fudged on truth in the name of grace. Everything he said you could count on. It's truth. And that's refreshing in our day when lies constantly are coming at us from all directions. I said, what are the lies that we're hearing? So I made a list. This is a not a long list, and you couldn't read this because it's in my handwriting. Okay? <laughs> But just think about the lies that we are hearing. Even in the name of science. Be careful about what you believe in what you hear. Climate change, is that really true? Were these tornadoes the result of climate change? It's ridiculous. These are lies. Whiteness is automatically racist. Is that true? That's a lie. Gender confusion. Or poor young people being totally confused by the messages that they're getting about how they can determine their own gender preferences. You ever see this sign? Abortion saves lives. I saw that sign on the news. Abortion saves lives. Wait a minute. 
That's a lie. America is an evil, wicked nation. Well, we are. We're made up of sinners. But really, I'm thankful for our nation. Lies. We're swimming in lies, flooded with them. So you always want to ask yourself, is this really true? Why should I believe this? Am I going to base my life on what I just heard? It's not my truth, my truth or your truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. Alex just read that to us, quoted that to us. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. You don't determine truth. Christ is truth. And even when the media tells us that science says, that science may not be true science. True science and Christ's truth never contradict. Jesus came full of truth, not lies. Even churches where people go to hear the truth. That's why people should go to church. I want to know the truth about how to get to heaven. I want to know the truth about how I should live my life in this world. And so churches exist for the truth. And yet, uh, in many churches, the truth is not being clearly taught. I read about a church planning to have a study of the book. I think the author's last name was Gushy. The book is called Changing Our Minds. And this church is going to have a study, just like we sometimes have a book study. They're going to have a study about how this, this book is going to help them change their mind about all of the gender issues, as if Christ doesn't have anything to say about this. Yet in Matthew 20, 19, he told us the truth. A man shall leave his father and his mother, cleave to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. Truth. Everything he said was truth. The mainstream media, the dominant culture, is lying to people in the name of love and compassion. And yet these lies will take people to hell. And that's a sad reality. Satan is the great liar who is working hard to destroy our generation with lies. Christ came full of grace, saving sinners, and full of truth, never lying. He will never point you in the direction of the broad gate that leads to destruction, never. He will always point you in the direction of the narrow gate that leads to life. He doesn't lie. That's why he said, as I said earlier, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, what really is. The truth about God, about man, about salvation, about how to live our lives. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So, Jesus came full of grace and truth. One preacher said, grace and truth reach their culmination at the cross. Think about that. The truth of God's holiness and justice and wrath against sin was satisfied by Jesus' substitutionary death. And now Christ offers forgiveness, forgiving grace to those who confess and repent of their sins and put their trust in him. So, let's say that verse again together. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. You have it memorized now. It's a great word. Every word in that verse is good. Thank God that the word became flesh, that the word was born in Bethlehem, the God-man, 
that he died on Calvary, that he rose from the, from the dead. He ascended. He's now interceding for us at God's right hand. He is there as still the God-man. He always was God, but then he became man. Now he's the God-man. He's still in our skin, still in our, glor- still in our hum- uh, humanity, but he's glorified. His body is glorified. We're going to be glorified too with him when he comes back and takes us to be with him. The babe came full of grace, full of truth. He brought light to our darkness, life to our deadness. He opens our blind eyes. He raises us from our spiritual death. And like the angel said to those shepherds, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Infinitely greater than, as, as great as it was for us to put people on the moon. I mean, that is a great feat. I bet you couldn't do it on your own. It's amazing. From earth to moon, but infinitely greater that God came to earth as a human and put his footprints on planet earth. Infinitely great. And he's coming back again as a man, as the God man. Let me finish with Revelation 19, 11 through 13. This is when Christ returns. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. That's symbolic of his work on the cross. And his name is called the Word of God, Revelation 19. I sure hope you know him. I sure hope that you have humbled your heart, acknowledge your sin, you're going the wrong direction, repent, put your faith in Jesus Christ. He's able to save you. He's able to take you to the Father. If you're not sure about that, I would urge you even, even now as I pray, Cry out to God, Lord, I, I, I see the scriptures here that Christmas is all about Christ coming, dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. I want him as my Savior. Talk to God about that. Tell him that. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you this morning for the great story of Christmas. How dark it would be if he had never come. If those who hate him had their way, how dead this world would be under the curse of sin if the life, the light and the life of Jesus Christ had not come. Father, we thank you for Christ. Help us to meditate on this great verse. You became flesh. You dwelt among us. We saw your glory. You're full of grace and truth. Work in every one of our hearts. Help us to give you all the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.